All right, everybody. Welcome into another Auburn Live Basketball Show. Appreciate everybody for joining us. Another week, Jay Head. Another undefeated week for the Tigers, man. How you doing? How's your week been? I can't complain. Oh, busy so far, but you know what? We got two really nice wins to talk about. One over Vanderbilt, one over obviously uh, Ole Miss. Uh, and interested to hear your thoughts. Yeah, we'll get into uh, we'll get into all that as the Tigers keep rolling along in just a minute. Uh, before we do that, Session Cocktail, go give them a, a visit. If you haven't, great sponsor of the Auburn Live football and basketball shows downtown Auburn, right there on Magnolia Avenue, right next to Taco Mama. Great place to go have a drink, relax, um, not the normal college bar feel. Really, really, uh, uh, I, think them, I think their new menu is another week. So like their holiday menu, I think, is going to run through January. So if you didn't get a chance to, to get – uh, get in there and, and check out some of those drinks. I think it'll go for another about another week until February starts, and then that'll go away. And, uh, but go check them out. Always a great place to be. I went and had one quick drink actually on Saturday before the game. I met Hunter. Uh, if, if you've never been in there, Hunter's the owner, uh, really good dude. Uh, Joe's the general manager in there. So if you see either of them, tell them that we said hey. But went in there and had a drink on Saturday. Um, it was and it was it was hopping. Went in there about probably five thirty. Had one quick drink and then. Um, said hey and rolled on to the game so that kind of worked out good so if you're ever in town that's a good way to do it go have a drink then pop over to the game uh, by the way if you're going to the game on wednesday night in tuscaloosa session also has a bar in tuscaloosa um so <clears throat> feel free to go check them out there if you want to swing by and have a drink there before the game on wednesday night as well but great sponsors the sponsors of the show great friends there at session cocktail um, in downtown auburn as well as GameTime.co, GameTime, a proud sponsor of On3, as well as the Auburn Live shows. If you ever need any last-minute ticket um, ideas or tickets for concerts or comedy shows or sporting events, go check out GameTime.co. Go download the app. Use the promo code War Eagle, and you get 20% off your first purchase there at GameTime.co. Really a uh, a really kind of booming company. I see their ads and in, in, in commercials a lot now. So go check them out, gametime.co. I know I've encountered a few times where you need those last minute tickets where you just have a spur of the moment. You want to go check out a sporting event. Um, I was actually in Nashville, was gonna do I ended up not doing it, but gametime.co, I immediately I was gonna I was in Nashville for the bowl game. And mm -hmm. uh the Predators were playing on like the Nashville Predators were playing on I don't know, one of the one of the nights I was there. I didn't even think about it. And like 45 minutes before the game, I'm like, wait a minute. I'm, I'm like, I'm like one block away from Bridgestone. I'm like, I, I've never been to a, a Predators game. They're normally pretty good atmosphere. So I was about to do it. I ended up not doing it, but I immediately got on gametime.co. I could have gotten tickets right then and there. It would have been really, really easy. Um, so make sure you go check them out, gametime.co, sponsor of uh, of all the shows and on three and all that good stuff. All right, Jay Head, let's jump into this. Auburn goes 2-0, and uh, beats Vanderbilt by 15 on the road, beats Ole Miss by 23 was up by 33 or 34 in that game over Ole Miss. Another 2-0 week. They moved to 16-2 and on the season, 5-0 and in league play. They're now number eight in the AP poll. Um, they continue to, to look great in the computer polls. I think they're number three in, in the T-Rank analytics poll. They're like five or six in Ken Palm. They're, mm -hmm. I think, eight in net. So they're top ten across the board now that the human polls have, have caught up. Offensive and defensive efficiency continues to – to be really strong, them and Arizona are the only two teams in the country with the top 10 offensive and defensive efficiency, according to Ken Palm. Um, so really, it was just another week of, of more of the same. A bunch of balance, pretty good scoring, um, good defensive effort, really all across the board um, there, Jay Head, as this team has now set up themselves you know, for a, a good foundation to start conference play. What did you see Vanderbilt, Ole Miss, that you liked, didn't like? What are kind of some observations – looking back at uh, at that two and a week from you. Sure. As far as what I liked, I mean, I think it's just a, more of a continuation of what you and I have talked about, which is the theme of the season, depth up and down the roster. They just kind of grinded on both teams. I liked that they seemed to shoot the ball better at Vanderbilt than they have in the past. It didn't seem like the arena bothered them, and maybe that has to do with Vanderbilt's talent level. Maybe that has to do with Auburn. I'm not exactly sure, but – Liked seeing them come out there and handle business from start to finish, even though they got a little sloppy in the second half. Uh, a team that really just kind of continues to play within itself. 
and continue to do the things that it does of a Jalen Williams becoming a little bit of a superstar here recently on the stretch that he's been on, but the other continuing pieces in and out of the lineup just continuing to contribute, uh, whether it's Dylan Cardwell or Chaney Johnson, who seems to have found himself a little bit here recently. You know, you, you talked a couple of weeks ago about him looking kind of like a baby deer. <laughs> and now all that coordination has come in, you know, our teenagers all grown up, but he, uh, you know, um, the point guard play between Aiden and Trey, um, the contributions you're now getting from Denver and KD, it just, it really is a two person tandem at each spot. I can sing the praises of each and every individual buying into their role. And the fact that this team, like I said, they're not to this point, they're not searching for an identity. They know who they are. They lean into their depth. They lean into the team camaraderie. They lean into sharing the ball. And that's what you appreciate. I think the things that concern you are still second half. You get a little sloppy, a little careless with the ball. Uh, you saw that in both against Vanderbilt and against Ole Miss. It's not the end of the world by any means. It's something Bruce is going to continue to harp on and continue to try to push because he realizes that they're not a finished product. And this is his, the, his way of getting their attention. Now, I don't think he's going to have any issue getting their attention as they go into the Alabama game. I think everybody knows uh, what that game means to this team and what it means into Auburn's standing within the league as far as how Auburn is truly viewed. But um, you want to clean that up in the second half. They they were almost too unselfish to a fault in the second half against Ole Miss. It, like it right. was one pass too many when they could have settled for layups or other shots. So – Want to see him maybe be a little bit more aggressive at times and not so passive in the second half trying to share the ball. But I think that's just a byproduct of guys enjoying each other, trying to make the extra pass. Just got to find the you know the right place for it. That's all. Yeah, I would um, I would agree with you, Jay Head. I think they they did a better against Ole Miss in terms of second half. They won the second half and it was a little more balanced effort. I like to see that. Vanderbilt's kind of more the same. What we've talked about too. I think they lost the second half to Vanderbilt the same way they lost the second half to LSU. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought they came back against Ole Miss and looked pretty consistent in terms of winning that winning that second half. You mentioned the point guards, and and that's something we've talked about. We've talked about obviously as the season going on. We've talked about Trey and Aiden. And we've asked Bruce about them. But I was going and looking at the stats, and I may write on this. I'm just not sure. Um, yeah, but um, I was looking at sort of where they where they you know where they stood in some areas. Aiden is currently third in the league in uh, assist to turnover ratio. Mm. He's eleventh in the country. I think. I think that's right. Let me pull that. Let me. Let me. Let me. Let me make sure I got that right. Because there's, but yeah, three point six nine. So for every one turnover, he's got three point six nine assists. That's third in the league, and eleventh in the country, and of course first among freshmen in college basketball. Meanwhile. Trey Donaldson leads the entire league in assist percentage. Now, Trey turns the ball over a little bit more than Aiden, but his assist percentage is higher. It's 31.5%. Mm -hmm. So for those listening, that means when, when Trey's in the game, 31.5% of the possessions end in an assist by him. He's assisting on 31%, 31.5% of the bu buckets when he's on the floor. So one of your point guards is, is, is near the top of the league in assist-to-turnover ratio. The backup is near is is at the top of the league in just straight assist percentage, and then of course they're scoring about 17 points a game. But this team is so balanced that scoring wise, you can't read as there's a lot of scoring going on. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to have big scoring numbers from the point guards. Their job is to distribute, which they're doing a good job of. And I started thinking, and and actually going back and looking back, <clears throat> I think it's now it's still early. There's a lot of basketball left to play in the, to be played in this season. But Aiden and Trey are making the case so far. They are making a case to be the best point guard duo Bruce has ever had at Auburn. Better than Jared and Javon McCormick, um, which is probably, you know, that Final Four team, that was pretty good. Better than Wendell and Zepp the, the championship year when you had Jabari and Walker. Um, you had some other years where Sharif was the point guard, but you didn't have really a number two. Justin Powell played a little backup point guard. You had the season where – the season they finished second, and then COVID shortened it. Javon was the starting point guard, and Samir was kind of your backup point guard, was really good. Um, so you've had some years in there where they haven't necessarily had a true one and a true two point guard. 
But what they're doing, distributing the basketball and not turning the ball over, is uh, is is just massively impressive for a freshman and a sophomore. And and I mean, I would take you know Jared could really score. He could drive. He could shoot the three. But Aiden can shoot the three. Trey can shoot the three. I just so far those guys. If you're talking about the efficiency of Auburn on offense, it starts with them. They are so good at not pushing the limits, not trying to do too much, um, and and understanding sort of their role in this whole thing, where no matter which one's on the floor, you've got a guy that so far has shown himself to be under control, unselfish, and and somebody that will distribute the ball and not look for their shot first. I mean, perfect example was against Ole Miss. I thought there was a play that Trey made that that to, is just kind of an overlooked play, but it was so under control. It was in the – it was in the let's see, they were going, which I don't I don't remember which half it was, but it's a play where he drives baseline, um, kind of gets down there in in the weeds a little bit, stays under control, uses his physicality, kind of puts his shoulder and creates separation from his defender down there about the block. Knows that uh I can't remember who who it was, it was Cheney or Dylan or somebody right there. Um, goes up, gives a great pass between two defenders and just gives somebody just the easiest dunk of all time. And it was a play where once he drew, he could have easily gone up with it in between guys. It could have been a tough shot, but he was just really under control and then dishes it. And, and somebody gets an easy dunk and Aiden does that a ton. I mean, the amount of assists that Aiden gives to Janai and Jalen and those guys is remarkable, but those two guys continue to just really, really impress me with how they sort of operate the entire offense. And so when you look at this, this offense and amount, the amount of guys getting involved, it starts with Trey and Aiden. And um, Trey's coming a long, long way from last year. I think I looked it up, and his turnover percentage was like 20-something percent last year. He cut that in half. Um, and so, anyway, th those two guys, I don't know if I'll ride on it or not, but, I mean, it just in terms of point guard duo that Pearl's had, maybe not even – I could probably go back beyond Auburn. I, mean, I could probably start looking back at Tennessee and stuff. But what those two guys are doing um, is, is just massively impressive. And I feel like we talk about it, but it could probably be talked about more and more every game that goes on just assist i think last week they were six to one assist to turnovers or against Ole miss they were six to one it's just mm -hmm. they keep coming up with games like that where if you combine their effort it's like your starting point goes up guard, guard is going out there on a nightly basis and going about six to one or seven to two in terms of assist to turnovers and it's just it's just impressive man very especially when you when you consider their age like you just discussed and probably from a talent level standpoint the only combination that comes to mind in the, in the Bruce Pearl era would be Jared Harper and Davion Mitchell before Davion obviously transferred to Baylor. When you had yeah. those two together, that was obviously a very talented group. But this is a very talented group in its own right, and I think given time, Aiden can absolutely be an NBA player. I don't know what Trey's future is, but you love the way he's kind of coming to his own, has played under control this year, has just been that steady hand that you needed – as Aiden's found his footing specifically in SEC play. And I do think that Aiden had his best game against Ole Miss that he's had in a while. I mean, I saw him slip some screens, do some things, shoot the ball at a high clip. He seemed to be bothered a little bit by some of the physicality early on in the SEC. He didn't – that wasn't an issue against Ole Miss, and maybe that's the size of Ole Miss's point guard or the matchup that he had there. But I thought that he looked significantly more comfortable, and maybe he's just settling in. And now he gets a matchup against Mark Sears, where Sears is obviously the straw that stirs the drink on the offensive side for Alabama. But I'm not quite sure defensively if he presents a series of problems. So I'll be interested to see what the matchup's like in that game moving forward. And I'm with you. The point guards have been very impressive. Probably the only other thing more impressive is the combination of the two centers. What you're getting out of, yeah. you know, <laughs> what you're getting out of Janiah and what you're getting out of Dylan Cardwell. I just – I don't think anybody thought that Dylan would make the leap that he's made this year or play the mm -hmm. way he did. And I heard you on the next round the other day, and I, I think you were spot on with your characterization of, of that situation and kind of the minutes – you know, Dylan's only playing 15, 17 minutes a night, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You put him over a 30-minute stretch, and those numbers really catch your eye. And, yeah. you know – if I had to guess, maybe Dylan has a nice conversation with OTV after the season's over to see what we can do about getting him to come back. Yeah. But um, 
Now, it's been remarkable. Point guard and center are the two positions that jump out at you. When you're looking at duos, those are the two that really stand out and say, you know what, we, we, we've got something to lean on or lean into in this group. Yeah, you mentioned Dylan. All Dylan did last week was set a career high in points uh, at Vanderbilt with 12 and mm -hmm. then turn around and do it again against Ole Miss. So he had back-to-back -back career high nights um, matching with, with, with 12 points. He was 9 of 13 from the field in those two games. And, and more impressively, and I keep saying this, and I just don't think I don't think people fully appreciate this. Dylan Cardwell shot 32% from the free throw line last year. 32%. You know what he's shooting right now? 69%. Yeah. That's now you might say 69%. Like that's not bad for a period. That's not for a center. To go from 32 to 69% in a season, in a year. Is unbelievable. He's hit eight of his last nine, eight of his. I mean, sorry, he's hit nine of his last ten over the last couple of SEC games, uh, including I think he went um, two for two against Ole Miss and like four for four against Vanderbilt. It's just his jump is crazy. He's fifth in offensive rebounding in the league. Um, yeah, fifth, and he had I think he had five offensive rebounds in, in, in last week alone. Um, and then you mentioned Jalen. Of course, Jalen's been unbelievable. He is. Jalen is 27 of 35 in SEC play. 27 of 35 in SEC play shooting the basketball. Um, he was 12 of 14 last week. I mean, it's stupid how good he's been. And then, of course, Janai wrote – Janai just quietly goes along because Jalen and Dylan's playing better. Janai kind of just quietly goes along and had a 15 and 12 night against Vanderbilt mm -hmm. and then 13 and 5 against Ole Miss. Um and here's another stat that I thought was interesting about Jana. Um, Katie Johnson leads the team in steals per game, 1.3 steals per game. Right. You know, second, Jana at 1.2 steals per game. I thought that was really interesting because um, Jana had six steals last week. He had three against Ole Miss and three against Vanderbilt. He does some things that Jana is not the most athletic guy. Sure. But he's crafty, but he does he does a bunch of things, and, and steals and assists is one of them where – you don't get that from your center normally where he could have three assists or four assists in a game, or he could come up with two or three steals. Um, he's a really active guy. So that front line, Jalen, Jana, and Dylan was, was fantastic. And Broom, Broom also leads the league in defensive rebounding percentage. So your, your starting center leads the league in defensive rebounding percentage. Your backup center is fifth in offensive rebounding percentage. And then what Jalen's doing. So it's like, I mean, everywhere you look, and I mean, you could point out bench points. They still lead – Auburn still leads the country mm -hmm. in bench points per 40 minutes. Um, and so it's just like everywhere you look, there's there's things that – a bunch of things they do really well that contribute to winning. So if they have an off night on offense, they're starting to play defense, by the way. Ole Miss, according to uh, college basketball analytics, the Ole Miss game was their best defensive game of the season, I think. Or it was the best defensive game of of league play for sure. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I had that wrong. It was. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was wrong. It was um, their second best. Their A and M was their best defensive game, but to hold old, hold Ole Miss to nine of thirty one shooting in the second half. So the point is now they're starting to play defense, and they already have balance on offense, and they rebound pretty well, and they take care of the ball pretty well. They didn't against Ole Miss. That was a little disappointing, but there's just a bunch of things they do well, which is the kind of one of those signs you look for. In a team, if you take something away, they do a bunch of other things well that's going to keep them in pretty much every game they play. I agree. And back to your point on Janai, he's just a high IQ basketball player. I mean, you can see his awareness on the court, his court vision. And, and you're right, he's not the best athlete. I mean, I, I think there are times where when he gets matched up against a more athletic center that it's a very tough cover for him. But the other ways he finds to contribute, it's, it's his mind where he sees the game in a way that not a lot of people do. And like you said, it allows him to get into passing lanes and to do other things from an assist standpoint that just not a lot of centers, not a lot of plays they can make. Uh, and to your point, I mean, you talked about Jalen. I really do. In the last two games, I've seen something kind of start to happen with Chaney Johnson. I'm not saying he's in, in any way on the level, uh, you know, playing with Jalen, but – he really is starting to – you can see him where he's feeling more comfortable. And the athleticism, you're starting to see it show. I mean, on that last block that he had in that old Miss game, yeah. 
I mean, he literally almost ate the backboard. He did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. We're lucky he didn't go yeah. to the bench this week. So, and, and it wasn't just that. I mean, he was under control going, you know, to the basket. Some of the assists that he made in that game. It just feels like that transition from Division Two to Power Five basketball. He finally feels comfortable. He's finding his role and his niche within the offense, within the team, and he's starting to show you know, now that he is comfortable, what he's capable of. And and I don't think he's anywhere close to what his ceiling is. And again, he's not going to pass Jalen this year. Jalen has separated himself. He is Mm -hmm. without doubt one of the better players in the SEC. But now you don't have to worry about playing Jalen extended minutes because Cheney's capable of coming in there and giving you those 15 minutes. Like he's earning that right now. Uh, Same with KD and Denver. You just don't lose a lot when those guys go in and out with each other. Um, and I love how they complement each other and the way they're both playing defense. Yeah, you're. I mean, Shaney made a couple of plays against Ole Miss that he hasn't made all year. Yeah. One, one in particular was, I think the first half. Yeah, first half uh, crossover, and pulls up mid range, nothing but net. I, yeah. I was like, okay, where has that been? What's funny is, by the way, you, you don't, you just don't see a lot of Shaney. I, I go into practice back before the season started. Cheney can shoot. I, I've seen it in practice, and I, I think I posted it way back in August or whatever. I'm like, listen, uh, you know, Cheney's a pretty good spot-up shooter. He just he doesn't play the minutes, and he's not really going to pull any of that in a game because the way they – just there's kind of no sense in him doing that. But mm-hmm. that play, and then he had another one in the second half. He had a great assist in the second half where he he drove to the lane and kind of pulled up, drew two, two defenders and made a pass, but he also knocked down the shot kind of doing the same. But – he made a couple of plays offensively that were under control, fluid, and smooth. And um, the athletic ability has always been there. But I think he just hasn't really figured out in his limited minutes. You know, it, it, it's tough when you're a new player, especially when you're coming off the bench and then you have a team like Auburn that's playing well and there's a lot of balance. When you get in there, it's like, well, when can I be aggressive? And Cheney's mm-hmm. probably battled some of that where he's thinking – Okay, is it my place to be really aggressive when in there? Because I got KD and Chad Baker's in here and Trey's in here, and who who am I to be to like sort of be selfish at times? Like I want to I want to I want to be aggressive here, and I think he struggled with that some. So hopefully, with with the Ole Miss game, he struggled against Vanderbilt. The Ole Miss game specifically, maybe that gives him a little confidence to hey, if you're in there and you got a one on one down there and you think it's a matchup. You know, be aggressive and 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 try to make a move there, and yeah. hopefully he'll do he'll do some more of that. Um, but you're right. I mean, it doesn't matter really who they who they go to. Um, I mean, you still look at the stats, man, and still the best lineup in terms of box score plus minus all year. Is still, the best lineup is an all backup lineup: KD, Trey, Chaney, Chad Baker, and Dylan. That's the best lineup for the season. Uh, from a combination plus minus standpoint, plus 60. The next best lineup is KD, Trey, Chad Baker, J. Will, and Dylan Cardwell. So four backups. They're plus 38. Um, and so there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, there's, there's, you know, I think it's at times they're going against maybe the other backups and the other backups aren't as good. So if you, you know, if you flip flop that and you took Auburn starters and brought them off the bench, well, their plus minus is probably going to be like that. So, um, it's it's not necessarily saying those guys are better than the starters. It's just it's it's a testament, I think, to just the overall depth compared to the depth of the teams that they're playing. It's um, and they did it again. I mean, there was I don't remember what it was. It was probably a 15, 17 point game, probably a few minutes into the second half, and then boom, 12 0 Auburn run in the first six minutes of that second half, all backups. It was a 12 0 run from the from the bench, completely from the bench. They come in, it was just Cheney dunk, Chad Baker three, Dylan bucket, 12 0 run, the lead's 30, and you did it with your all with your backups. Yep. Hard to deal with, man. If you're a if you're if you're an opponent, opponent, really tough to deal with. Agreed. Um, the floor of consistency. That's the thing. The floor of consistency is so high for this team. I don't think either you or I know what the ceiling is just yet or what they're capable of. I think. Over the next five games, we're going to have a much clearer picture of that. That's for sure, because you're going to get that opportunity to play some really quality opponents. But the floor of success, I mean, be just because of the consistency you have in that lineup, I mean, you feel very certain that this team is very capable of winning 
at a minimum 11 games in the SEC. I mean, at a minimum. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's just insane to me it, because I don't know that I, I thought this team was capable of a Sweet 16 run coming into the year. I really wasn't sure of what we were going to get. Did we have a superstar? Well, you might have a superstar in Jalen or Janai, but you just got a really a lot of really talented players, Justin. I mean, just a ton of really talented players that play well as a unit because we've seen a lot of talented players in Arkansas that don't play well as right. a unit. Yeah. You know, and, and that's a credit to Bruce for getting these guys to buy in and play together and be willing to split minutes because not every team is willing to do that. Yeah, it's it, it, he never he never ceases to kind of amaze you in his ability to motivate and get and get a lot out of his players and, and sort of, um, you know, figure out sort of the chemistry issue. They just play a different they play a different style. And when everybody buys into it, it's really good when they don't. It's it's what happened last year where they were fortunate to get in the tournament and because they played a pretty good schedule. And so I think that helped and a lot of really close games, close losses. But that team had a bunch of flaws. Um, and he probably got about as much he, as he could out, out of that team. Um, yeah. I think they were they were a nine seed in the in the uh, in the tournament. But man, I mean, whether it's KD or I mean, whether it's Aiden or Trey, whether it's KD or Denver, whether it's Semo or Chad Baker, and Semo has his limitations, um, but he plays hard, knows what to do. Um, whether it's Jalen or, or Chaney, Chaney's kind of Semo right now, like plays hard, but not necessarily going to score a lot. A little mm-hmm. offensive drop off, but KD and Chad Baker um, sort of uh, sort of make up for that. And Dylan, it's just they're in a great spot. Here's what we don't know: they've played the 104 ranked schedule in the country according to ESPN's BPI Basketball Power Index. Ken Palm ranks their schedule 97th so far. T Rank um, Analytics, which is Torvik Analytics, which is really really good, very similar to Ken Palm. They rank Auburn's first five games in conference the 14th hardest conference schedule so far so the out of 14 in other words nobody's had an easier five games than auburn in right. sec play so that that's the that's the stuff when you hear bruce after the game say are we better than what they thought we were in the beginning of the season yeah but are we as good as they think we are now no i mean he, he and, and and i i've talked to him off the record it's, and he and it's more strong than that like he he is just very much he knows um, this team can be really good, mm-hmm. but he knows that there's some big tests that they haven't faced yet. And I would say it's different from last year. I think last year's team, I think last year's team, he thought had some real limitations. Like there's just some things that that, that they can't do, whatever. I don't think he, I don't think he feels those limitations this year. I think it's, I think this team's more equipped. Um, I just think right now he's he's just going. We haven't really been tested, so yeah. it's a diff- it's a different kind of trepidation from him. Where last year I think he was like, we're just kind of we are what we are. And I remember talking to him after the Memphis loss. Was it last year? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and he was like, there's going to be more. I mean, we're just we're just sort of are what we are. This year, it's like I think they're equipped there, but they just haven't been really, really tested. Five of the next six are against quad one uh, opportunities. Um, but I think I think the rest of the way, T-Rank has their conference schedule the fourth toughest out of 14. Um, and then their overall strength of schedule, I think ESPN has them with the 18th toughest schedule in the country the rest of the way. So it's going to get ratcheted up in a big way. Um, they're Alabama and Mississippi State, both on the road. And they don't even come home, by the way. They're going to play at Alabama Wednesday. They're going to stay in Tuscaloosa Wednesday night, stay in Tuscaloosa Thursday, tr- and just travel right on to Starkville um, and play that game Saturday, which makes a lot of sense. But there won't be – you know, there's not going to be an opportunity to come home in between. So it's going to be a, a, a trying week. And I think for for fans, I think just keep that in mind. Auburn is 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 got a lot of good things going for them. They're built pretty, they're built pretty well. But – Two close games this year, they lost them. Baylor and App State. Right. Like, so there's just some things that we still need to see. For, they're the only team in the top 29 in the net that doesn't have a quad one win. So there's ju- there's just still some things this team needs to prove. And and they may prove them. Like since App State, they may just be like, well, we haven't had the opportunity. Give us the opportunity. We'll go beat Alabama. May- then maybe they do that. But we just there's just still some things I think we want to see from this team, battle some adversity, 
Kentucky looks really good. Tennessee looks really good. Those two teams, I probably – those two teams to me, I probably would put above Auburn right now. I think that I think in the AP poll ranking reflects that. I think that's fair. Like mm-hmm. those two teams have played hell of hell of schedules and, and look really, really good. Absolutely. But Auburn can Auburn can be that. They can. They can they can be that, I think. No, I I don't disagree with you. Look, we played a team that's probably of the caliber of three or four teams that they've played in Baylor and played them extremely well. Yeah. Uh so I fully believe that Auburn is capable of being just as good. And, and I have Auburn in the top three. Like if you're looking at the SEC right now, I don't think you can say who's one, who's two, who's three, but I think you can name the group. And yeah. very clearly to me, that's Auburn, Tennessee, Kentucky. And Alabama very, has a very compelling case to be number four. And so you're getting that opportunity to play against a really tough team in an area that's not going to be nice to Auburn when they get there. I mean, you're going to have to deal with, with, with a crowd that's, you know, going to be rowdy when Auburn gets there. Um, and again, I think we discussed it before, but you're talking about the number one offense efficiency team in Alabama um, as it as it pertains to Ken Palm. So if you don't come out and shoot the ball at a pretty decent clip, you can find yourself down pretty quickly if they get it going. And they seem to get it going at home. I, I know that Missouri is not of the caliber that Auburn is, but they jumped on them something fierce about a week ago and it got ugly quick. So how does Auburn adjust to what Alabama is doing? Um, can they stay in the game and weather that initial storm? Cause Alabama seems to get off to a hot start in their gym and that's test one. You're right. This five game stretch is really going to kind of define Auburn as it pertains to where they're going to be viewed by the NCAA tournament committee uh, because there is an opportunity to get three, four, maybe even five quad one wins on their resume, um, I, I think you probably need to get three um, out of that group and hopefully more than that. I don't think anybody – I don't think Bruce would be content with just three, but I think that's the minimum of what you need to get before you play some other important games um, in the back half of the season. Yeah, and and, and and look, the positive is they don't have any bad losses either. They, they, they're, uh, they're, both their losses are quad one now. App State is now considered a quad one loss at the moment. So your two losses are quad one losses. You got no no quad two, three, or four losses where there's some other teams um, that do have a quad three loss in there or a quad two loss. So, um, yeah, you mentioned Alabama. They got three players in the top eight in three-point percentage in the league, and all of them have shot a lot. I mean, Sam Walters is second in the league in percentage. He shot, and he shot 47 threes. Um, Then you got Mark Sears, who's shot 93 threes, and he's shooting 47%. There is not, I mean, that's a, that's a crazy percentage. Um, And then you've got Latrell Reitzel, another guard for Alabama, who shot 76 threes. He's at 43%. So you got three guys in the top eight in terms of uh, three point percentage. Jalen Williams, by the way, is in there at number six at 45%, um, which is just, it's all guards. Literally you have Sam Walters at Alabama, who's a forward, um, and then Jalen is a forward, and then everybody else in the top eleven is is guards. But uh, but yeah, they obviously can shoot the basketball. They're going to fly up and down the court um, offensively. And Mississippi State similar; they can shoot. They can shoot from outside when they get hot. So you're playing two really good offensive teams, both yeah. on the road. It's going to be a, a a big test. And man, I mean, really, App State was a unique uh, was a unique road game. Arkansas. It started off that way. Chad Baker is the hero of that game. Chad Baker coming in early to flip the switch on that game. If he doesn't do what he did in in the first half of that game, that could have been – I mean, who knows? If he doesn't get them going, who knows? And then once they got going, Arkansas's got – you know, they played well. Arkansas's got a bunch of issues, and it turned into a 30-point game. But um, at Alabama is going to be ratcheted up. Start on a weekend is going to be ratcheted up. Just um, big test, man. Big test. If they could come out, honestly, they come out one and one, I think you're happy um, because I think they're two tests that they haven't really faced so far. I think you come out one and one and um, and you're, you know, I mean, you want to win them both. But sure. on the road in the SEC is freaking hard. Would it shock me if they go to Alabama and lose? Heck no. Heck no. Absolutely not. And 
I know everybody's very familiar with Nate Oates and the caliber of coach that he is, but for those that aren't aware, Chris Jans is a fantastic coach mm-hmm. for Mississippi State. I mean, I think he gave Bruce all kinds of problems in the NCAA tournament that yep. year when we had our Final Four run when he was at New Mexico State. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that one. Nope, yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, but Jans is a guy that's an extremely good coach, very, uh, very good in X's and O's, and they've got a tough team. I mean, they they play really, really well. In Starkville, did they beat AM or Kentucky? Somebody, I think they beat in Starkville. Didn't they beat um who beat Tennessee? Didn't they, they beat Tennessee? Let's see. Let me pull them up real quick if you can get to it quicker. I because Tennessee's got a loss, and I, I thought it might have been in Starkville. Like second game of the um like second game of uh of conference play. Let's see. I got it coming up right here. Oh, come on. Yeah, the Mississippi State had a six, an eight point loss to Bama. Nope. I guess it wasn't. I guess it wasn't Mississippi State. Mississippi State lost to South Carolina's another upstart team. Yeah, Mississippi State beat Tennessee by five. There you go. So, Second game. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Shows you shows you what they're capable of, you know, on their home court. So while Auburn fans look, I'm with you. I think they need to be measured going into this. And the expectation should probably be you what you hope for, not even the expectation is one and one. You don't want to go 0 and two, but I think temper the emotional responses sometimes that we can get coming off of losses because there's a I mean there's the potential there that you could be 0-2, 1-1, and maybe even 2-0. and But I don't think that should be the expectation that you're just going to win both these games because of the way Auburn's looked to start the season. You're right. The schedule probably – I mean, it's not probably. The analytics bear it out. is not as difficult as some of the other teams have played to this point. So we're going to know more about ourselves. I mean, that's just the thing. That's what an SEC schedule will do for you is you will know who you are by the time you get to postseason. All your weaknesses will be ID'd. Everybody will know, you know, I mean, what you're capable of and what you're not, given who you're going to have to play. Because, I mean, you don't get a cheap one down the stretch. I mean, you get Tennessee, you get Kentucky, um, you get State, you get Alabama twice, you get Florida. You know, these are all really good basketball programs. South Carolina, who's Lamont Paris has had a surprising start to this year, and they seem to be a very connected group. Yeah, I mean, down the stretch, you're looking at there's really only one game, and that's at home at Vanderbilt, uh, home to Vanderbilt, which is in um, about a week and a half. They play Bama, Mississippi State, then they come back and play Vanderbilt at home. That is the only game left on the schedule that you could point to right now and go, I mean, barring a disaster, right? Like, that's a win. Everything else, I mean, even look, even what they just did to Ole Miss, I promise you that game in Oxford will be very different. That's mm-hmm. a good enough team. Like, they're, they're, athletic enough in Oxford that will be that will be a game and you're right South Carolina's playing really well you get that game at home um and so Auburn Auburn sh- should be in pretty good shape for that one but South Carolina's playing well but you're talking about two games against Bama a game against Kentucky Tennessee at Georgia Tennessee barely escaped at Georgia Georgia's better um Missouri you play them once it's there it's a long road trip like there's just it, it just changes dramatically the schedule from here on out um, what do you want to see this week outside of, of two wins? Obviously, um, you know, I think I'm curious defensively to see where this team continues to go because when we talked to Bruce before the year, it, that was the issue. Yeah, he was like, Look, we're gonna score. I, I like the amount of weapons we have defensively. I don't know, and that was my thing too. Like, are these guys gonna come together? Are they gonna understand what it takes to play good defense? And they're and they're coming along, they're, they're doing some good things defensively. This week, I think it's going to show a lot. I think you've got two teams that are pretty good offensively that can shoot from the outside. Of course, Alabama, you know what you're getting there. Yeah. Um, and then let's see, like Mississippi State, let's see where they're at. Uh, they are – Mississippi State's actually 77th in offense, but 15th in uh, Ken Palm's defense def- defense uh, ef- efficiency. That surprised me because I've seen Mississippi State a few times and they really can't shoot when they get it going. Alabama – kind of reverse. They're number one in offense, mm-hmm. 64 in defense. Their issue is they don't play defense all the time. I mean, Tennessee put 90 on them. So that's that's going to be a track meet. 
in Tuscaloosa. Mississippi State plays some pretty good defense, so that'll be interesting. But I'm curious to see just sort of how Auburn's defense continues to improve because even as good as the Final Four team was, like that team started to clamp down defensively. The Samir Okoro team could play defense. Mm -hmm. The Jabari Walker team could play defense. Um, that's that's the calling card, especially when you get in a postseason, is your ability to play defense. And I think Bruce said something really interesting after the Ole Miss game. He said they're starting to understand – they're starting to understand, and this is everything with Bruce's offense. It's everything. When you play good defense, it will turn into the good opportunities on offense. You have to view it that way. You can't, you can't, uh, you can't say, "Well, I'm going to play." But then when I get on, and just you can't view offense and the way Bruce assists. You can't just view offense on its own. If you will play good defense, man, the opportunities you're going to get on offense. And he's like, they're starting to see that. Man, if we lock it down and play and create turnovers. I mean, we're going to get great chances on the other end, um, and they're starting. They're starting to see that, especially with that backup unit, KD and Chad Baker, um, Trey. Those guys are playing phenomenal defense. But that's probably the thing for me. I want to continue to see. I know they've got weapons yep. and they've got versatility on offense. If the defense, if that continues to come along, that's probably one of the the biggest signs. If you're starting to think about what this team could look like in March, let's see how this defense continues to get. Um, to get better and hold somebody like Ole Miss to – I mean, Ole Miss scored 100 points on Florida. They scored 80 at LSU. They have the ability to score, and Auburn held them to 59. Texas A&M. Texas A&M scored – what, they scored 90 on Kentucky? I mean, Texas A&M can score. Auburn held them to 55. Like, there's a couple There's a couple of games right there where you're starting to look at Auburn's defense and go, huh, okay, this is a pretty good unit. I think for me, and, and you talked about it earlier with their age, but how do two young point guards adjust to hostile environments on the road? Because these will be the, these are more hostile than the neutral site, site game that they faced against Baylor. Obviously, Appalachian State ended in a loss, uh, but Boone does not compare uh, to what he's going to see in Tuscaloosa and what they're going to mm -hmm. face in Starkville. So how do they adjust? How quickly do they kind of, start to get comfortable and be able to run the offense and orchestrate everything that they need to do to make sure that this team's in it as you go down the stretch and or is pulling away. And then in the vein of a close game, can Auburn win a close game? Because everything's been a blowout. I don't think that's going to be the case all season long. I could be wrong, and I'll be glad to eat crow. Look, if Bruce wins every game by double digits, sign me up for a big, <laughs> tasty play to crow, okay? Yeah. Yeah. But my guess is is that they're going to have some tough games, and how does this team react to adverse situations? You know, and that stimulated that stimulated from the point guard down to everybody else, and you're going to need to see some of those vets step up and help calm these young guys down, because I promise you, they're going to get frustrated at times with the way Mississippi State plays defensively. They're going to get up in you, and they're going to make you uncomfortable. Alabama's a little bit of a different challenge. Then, like you said, it's more about keeping up in a track meet and staying within yourself when you're doing that. You can't get out of your game and fall into just shooting long-distance threes all game long. Man, look, we can shoot it. Unlike last year, I have a lot of confidence in this team to shoot it. But I don't think it's our strong suit to come down and just jack one up from 32 feet right. just because, you know, you cross half court. And that's the way Alabama can play at times. I mean, they are that fast, they get it up that quick, and they shoot it that well. So you can't fall into that trap. But how these two young guards run the offense on the road how they communicate with each other in hostile environments and work through, you know, some arduous situations that are going to be uncomfortable for a team that has not struggled in a while. I mean, they haven't struggled since Boone. Everything's been double digits. So yep. watching that adjustment, that's going to be the big piece to me moving into this week. Yep. 11 straight wins all about double digits and, and three straight now conference games where um, LSU, Vanderbilt and Ole Miss – you had uh, LSU Vanderbilt, you had 17 point halftime leads. Ole Miss, you had a 19 point halftime lead. So Auburn leads the country in first half scoring margin over 14 points per game in the first half. But you've had now three games in a row in the SEC where you have blown the doors off this team. And at halftime, this game's over. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, LSU went on a 21 to 2 run and you still were like, oh, Auburn's still going to win. I mean, it's just so, yeah, I think, I think you make a great point about the guards. Um, real quick before we get out of here. Um, a little bit of T-Rank predictions. Tennessee is the hardest game left on the schedule, according to T-Rank. They give Auburn a 40% chance to win. They predict a three-point loss to Tennessee. Okay. 
other than that game, the next two games that are the lowest percentage Auburn has to win are the next two. Alabama, Mississippi State. Wow. Um, 44% against Alabama. It's the only other game against Tennessee, other than Tennessee, according to T-Ranks Analytics, which their predictions are are, are really, really good a lot of times. Mm-hmm. The, they predict Alabama to win by one, and they give Auburn a 44% chance to win. And then Mississippi State, they give Auburn a 63% chance to win. They predict that game to be a three-point game. So you're talking about two games that are going to be nail-biters, and if every game left on the schedule – it's two of the toughest three are coming back to back this week, both on the road. So just understand kind of what Auburn's stepping into. and We'll see how they um, respond and, and, and take a step back. Look, if they were to go 0-2, that would suck. But just take a step back and try to figure out, you know, what, what, what we're going to sort of glean from this. Um, if they win, lose, we'll sort of look at some other factors and see how they, how they, uh, how they play. But big week for Auburn, nonetheless, inside the top 10, uh, again, and I think they've been in the top 10 in half of the seasons. In five of the seasons that Pearl's been here out of the 10, <laughs> Auburn's been in the top 10, which is just is still wild to um, to say out loud that yep. uh, half the half the seasons he's been here, Auburn, Auburn hadn't been a ranked team. They've been a top 10 team at some point in the season. Just an amazing run. Um and from this, and, and you're right about the point guards. Maybe we'll wait and see. Maybe we'll wait and have that Trey Aiden discussion. Let's let's see how they play on the road at Bama, on the road at State. Uh, maybe wait a couple of more games and let things play out. But so far, from an effectiveness and a production standpoint, they are as good a duo oh, um, yeah. at, as as doing the right thing, not getting out over their skis. Um, and here's the other thing, crazy thing before we go, by the way, since you mentioned the point guards. Trey's, um, Trey's assist percentage is 31 and a half, I think. Wendell's with Walker and Jabari that year was 35. So that's a crazy high number, but think about Wendell tossing lobs up to Walker and he's got Jabari to pass to is at 35 and Trey's at 31. I know um, he doesn't have Walker and Jabari. No, I mean, you're talking two NBA first round picks that you had on that team. And that's why my eyes got big when you said that, because I would have expected the number to be even be a little higher yeah. given the amount of lobs they executed that season. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, it, it was an obscene amount. Yeah. Um, <laughs> by the way, in doing that research, you know what Sharif's assist percentage was the year he was here? No. 47%. <sighs> I mean, that you know, like that team was Bruce's worst team. They were just super young, but talk about a one-man show. When Sharif was on the floor, he was assisting on half, half you know, of everything Auburn did that year. And I still believe Auburn potentially even makes the tournament that season if Sharif's able to start the year. But, you know, he had to sit out, I think, it was the first 10, maybe even 12 games of that season. Yeah, yeah. And we were moonlighting with Justin Powell at, at point guard somewhat to yeah. his injury. Yeah, I think that team went 13 and 14 or something like that. But, uh, yeah, Sharif averaged 20 points a game that year. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's like 50% of uh, assist rate, which is just crazy. All right, let's get out of here. Uh, it'll be a fun week for Auburn basketball no matter what. Make sure you're at auburnlive.com. Um, have all the action. Uh, I'm going to go to Tuscaloosa Wednesday. I will not go to Startville, but I'm going to be there in Coleman, and uh, we'll see how it goes inside that. I try to stay away from Coleman. And if I'll any Alabama fans are listening or whatever. Huh? <laughs> I'll be praying for your safe return, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, hopefully, look, I think some Auburn fans will, will be there, um, but that place just depresses me. It just does. <laughs> I've been there some. I've been there so many times over my life, and I'm sorry. I'm if Alabama fans, I'm sure that there's none listening to the Auburn show, but uh, but they know, they know that place is dark and gloomy. It just is. Okay, you know, you know it's true, um, but it but it'll be man. But it's always hostile, 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 and that's yeah. what you're gonna get. Regardless of Alabama's loss to Tennessee, you're gonna get a hostile environment um, come Wednesday night because they got a chance to knock off. The team that's atop the SEC rankings, which is Auburn, once again going in there early in the season with um, a lot on the line. So it ought to be fun. Um, all right, quick shout-out to Session Cocktail before we get out of here. Sponsor of, of uh, all the Auburn Live shows, Session Cocktail. Go make them um, a place that you go get some drinks before dinner. And, um, go check them out, please. Downtown Auburn, Magnolia Avenue. Tell them that we said uh, that we sent you, and uh, we would appreciate that. All right, J-Head. Let's get out of here. We'll see everybody next week. We'll see you on the boards. See you at the corner. See you on the message boards. Talking some basketball. Talking some football. 
Um, and we'll get back at this thing uh, next week, and we'll see. We're either going to have some some tough times to talk about or two monster wins to talk about or something in between, but it's going to be really interesting. We're going to learn a lot about this Auburn basketball team over the next week. All right, for Jay Head, I'm Justin. We'll see you.